Welcome to Lesson 5b, Supersonic Wind Tunnel Design. In this lesson, we'll compare subsonic and supersonic diffusers, and then discuss why they're useful in the design of both subsonic and supersonic wind tunnels. I'll also discuss the usefulness of a second throat in a supersonic wind tunnel, and I'll show you some different types of supersonic wind tunnel designs. First, let's review subsonic diffusers. Consider first a subsonic wind tunnel. I've built a couple wind tunnels like this, where flow gets sucked in at the inlet. We go through a honeycomb and a screen, and then the flow goes into the test section, where your goal is to have high speed, uniform flow. Then you have a blower or a fan. Suppose the wind tunnel ends here, and the flow comes out like a jet at speed VE. Well, for subsonic flow, the exit pressure is the same as the back pressure, and in this case it's atmospheric pressure. Pressure is less than atmospheric here because of the suction, and you get a subsonic jet going out into the room. Well, as I explain in one of my short videos, you can gain extra speed by adding a diffuser. Namely, we have a diverging duct downstream of the fan that slows down the flow. Recall that pressure goes up in this diffuser and speed goes down. We still have flow at some VE, we'll call it VE2 compared to VE1 originally. So VE2 is less than VE1, but P is still atmospheric here. So since pressure is rising up to atmospheric pressure here, the pressure here has to be lower than atmospheric. Same with the pressure here, which is even lower. So comparing the flow here and the flow here, this one has lower pressure, and therefore you can think of it as extra suction that will make the test section speed larger. We get a higher speed through the test section, and it doesn't cost us any more electricity since this is just a diffuser. Alternately, you can get the same test section speed with a smaller fan output, therefore less power. Another way to think of it is that we're wasting less kinetic energy since the speed is a lot smaller here than it is here. In either case, all the kinetic energy coming out of the wind tunnel gets wasted into heat in the room. All this is for a subsonic wind tunnel. Can we do a similar thing for a supersonic wind tunnel? Let's consider a blowdown type of wind tunnel like we've been talking about, where you have a converging diverging duct with stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature upstream with back pressure PB, and as we've been discussing, if PB is low enough, we get supersonic flow here. Let's call this the test section, where we have uniform supersonic flow, say at Mach 2 or something like that. If we just exhaust the air from this test section into the outside air with back pressure PB, again you have some speed VE, which is huge, in fact supersonic. In that case, you would waste a lot of kinetic energy, not to mention that it would be very noisy. One way around this is to have your test section diverge a little bit and tune it up so that you have a shock at the exit plane. The shock would make VE go down, in fact subsonic instead of supersonic, which would waste less kinetic energy, but you also have large losses across the shock. And this shock would be fairly strong since it's at some Mach number like 2, for example. Now consider adding a diffuser like we did with the subsonic case. Let's delete this shock and the exit speed and add a diffuser. Well, as you should recall from the first week of class, a diffuser for supersonic flow is the opposite of what we had for subsonic. Namely, we must use a converging duct. Again, speed goes down and pressure goes up through this supersonic diffuser. Thus, the exit speed goes down as well, and we waste less kinetic energy. If the diffuser is well designed and goes to a small enough area, you can get a shock in the duct, so the flow goes from supersonic to subsonic. Now you have an even smaller VE and less kinetic energy wasted. But, sir, don't you still have large losses across the shock? Yes, Sean, but since Mach number goes down through the diffuser, this would be a very weak shock. For example, what if Mach number were about 1.1? Thank you, sir.
By the way, we can make the same argument here that we did for the subsonic wind tunnel. Namely, compared to the case without the diffuser, the pressure was PB here. But now, since pressure rises through the diffuser, and pressure is PB here, this pressure is lower than it was without the diffuser. Since the pressure here is lower, we can get away with a smaller P0 to generate the same Mach number flow. And since it costs money to pump up this tank, you can save money by adding the diffuser. But wait, that's not all. We can add a second throat. Instead of ending the diffuser there, why don't we expand with a diverging duct and adjust everything so that we have choked flow and sonic conditions here, just like upstream. In an ideal case, the flow is subsonic, supersonic, supersonic, sonic at both throats, and then subsonic here, and you get a very small VE without any shocks, so you don't even have this loss. And you could lower the stagnation pressure even further and still get the desired Mach number in the test section. Let's call this throat area AT1 and this second one AT2. Theoretically, for isentropic flow everywhere, AT2 should equal AT1. But real life isn't isentropic. There will be friction along these walls, and there will be a displacement effect due to the boundary layers, which as we've discussed in other videos, it effectively makes the area smaller because the walls are effectively thicker. So if AT2 is equal to AT1, we would be in trouble. What would happen in real life is you would get a shock forming here. In other words, this throat would be choked, but everything upstream would be subsonic. You no longer have a supersonic wind tunnel. In fact, the speed through your test section would be extremely low and subsonic. The only supersonic flow would be here upstream of the shock. Well, this is obviously not desired. So I'll ask the students, what should we do? Could you make the second throat larger than the first one? You are correct, Mr. Continuity. Let's make AT2 greater than AT1. I'll shift this guy up a little bit so that this throat is bigger than this one. If we were able to get this throat to just choke, we could have this ideal condition here, even including the effects of the boundary layers. But in practice, this is typically not possible. In real life, what we do is make this flow not be choked here, but keep it supersonic through the diffuser, but to a very low Mach number, say 1.05 or so, and then let the Mach number start increasing and get a very weak shock here. So this flow stays supersonic all the way to the shock. And then we go through the subsonic diverging diffuser, again achieving our goal of small kinetic energy losses at the exit where the pressure is PB. And we have a subsonic jet. Well, in real life, it's hard to achieve this. So what some wind tunnels do is have a mechanical mechanism to generate a variable area throat. In other words, you can adjust the area of this throat to make it smaller or larger. You start the flow with the large area here. You choke the flow and have supersonic flow through the whole thing with some shock maybe here. But then you slowly decrease the area of this second throat, causing the shock to move upstream. And right before it gets to the throat, is your optimum operating condition. That's pretty clever, dude. It is indeed, Joe. It is very clever. <laughs> In real life, if you try to make this area too small, what will happen is that this shock will suddenly jump back here somewhere. I illustrate that here. Once the area gets small enough, this shock gets swallowed into the test section, so there's no shock here, but the shock suddenly appears somewhere here. Then we no longer have supersonic flow, but rather subsonic flow everywhere. Or if you keep decreasing the area of this second throat, you can choke it again and get supersonic flow here. And another shock, we call this situation blocked. Because now no matter what you do downstream, the flow here is fixed. Everything is choked up to this shock, and you actually end up with two shocks in your wind tunnel. How do we avoid this? Well, we can do it by increasing the second throat area, enough to get back to this situation, where there's only one shock, and you get nice choked supersonic flow through this entire test section. 
in actual application, this situation is the best you're going to be able to do. But you can get this shock to move very close to the throat and therefore have really small losses across it. Dude, when the shock moved upstream, you said it was swallowed. So now, when it moves the other way, do we say it was thrown up or vomited out? <laughs> well, Joe, I suppose you can say that, but engineers usually use the word regurgitated instead. Now I'll show you some photographs of actual supersonic wind tunnels. By the way, this was known way back in the 30s. Here's an old wind tunnel with a variable area or adjustable second throat, like we've been talking about. The test section is here with some supersonic Mach number. You can see the first throat and the second throat. In practice, they start with this throat open, start to flow up, and then slowly decrease the area until you get a weak shock right here just beyond the second throat, as we've been discussing. Here's a much larger supersonic wind tunnel showing you all the hydraulic equipment with a flexible duct wall to vary the area of the second throat. Here's a picture of a wind tunnel from 1953 with just the first throat and the supersonic test section showing where they're studying some kind of rocket here. This Mach number is 1.5. In this wind tunnel, they used replaceable blocks to adjust the area and get different Mach numbers. Here's another picture of a supersonic wind tunnel with replaceable blocks. Finally, I discussed three types of supersonic wind tunnel and I couldn't find the reference for these old pictures that I had. The first one is called an intermittent indraft wind tunnel where like my subsonic wind tunnel that I had built, the flow comes in from the room, goes through a converging diverging nozzle a second throat like we've been talking about, subsonic diffuser, and then into a big tank that's pumped out by a vacuum pump. This is a suction type wind tunnel and you start with the near vacuum here but as the flow comes through the pressure keeps rising until you lose your supersonic conditions in the test section and then you have to stop and vacuum this out again. This one is called an intermittent blowdown wind tunnel this is similar to what we've been talking about for many weeks now. You have a large tank upstream with pressure P0 and temperature T0. Again, a converging diverging nozzle with supersonic flow through the test section. Here you're limited by the back pressure being the atmospheric pressure, but you can adjust P0 and T0 to get the desired mass flow rate through here. And as we've been discussing, you would typically have a very weak shock just downstream of the second throat and a subsonic diffuser. If your compressor were strong enough, you could run this thing continually, but oftentimes the compressor is not large enough, so you get a limited time of flow for testing. That's why they call it intermittent. Notice the dryer here. It's important to remove moisture from a supersonic wind tunnel, especially when you're doing flow visualization. Moisture is no friend of a wind tunnel. And as you may recall, the temperature goes way down at high speed supersonic flows like this, which would tend to condense water vapor into little drops. That would be very undesirable for Schlieren images. Finally, here's a closed circuit supersonic wind tunnel. Here you have a large compressor, so you don't even need an upstream storage tank. You go through your converging diverging nozzle, your second throat, etc. with a subsonic diffuser that returns the flow to the compressor. So this one is continuously running, but you can imagine how hot this flow would get with all the friction through this wind tunnel. So they have to have a cooler in there to cool the air going through. They also need a dryer, as we discussed previously, and they fill this whole wind tunnel with very dry air before even starting. Again, as we've discussed, you'd have a very weak normal shock just downstream of the second throat to optimize the power requirements to run this wind tunnel. With the added advantage that everything upstream of the shock all the way to this throat is choked, so pressure fluctuations and stuff through all this piping does not affect your test section flow. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. Now that's all there is to it.